us uh, to the President of the United States of America, Barack Obama. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to host you today, uh, and thank you very much for, for coming and, and, and really uh, giving, this, giving this presentation on the United States and Europe, short-term divergences but shared challenges. I think there is uh, also a little uh, paper that uh, uh, may, uh, may at some stage, I'm not sure whether it was, uh, was available, but um, uh, we, we, may, we may, may, may make that available also uh, at a later stage. Um, Jason will, will introduce uh, um, and, and uh, give his presentation. Following Jason's presentation, uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming Natasha Vaya. Uh, Natasha um, uh, works for uh, CP, but now for um, the European Investment Bank, I think, uh, and is the deputy director of, of CP. And so we are very happy to have you here with us today as well. Thank you for coming. Um, and then we have an open discussion. Um, overall, um, uh, we have one hour, so uh, uh, I do want to, to have a bit of time for discussion, so 15, 20 minutes maximum. Yep. Okay, Thank you. Great. So thanks so much for um, hosting me here. Thanks for everyone for coming. I'm a big consumer of, of what Bruegel produces, and it's nice to see it um, in person. I'll be relatively brief. Um, I think there's copies of an expanded version of what I'm talking about here. And if you look at the website of the Council of Economic Advisors, you'll also find it there, either now or certainly within and when everyone wakes up in the United States. Um, it will be there. Wanted to talk about you know, the short-run divergence between the experience of the United States and Europe, where I think um, some of the success in the United States in recovering more quickly and more fully contains important lessons in terms of the importance of a combination of fiscal, monetary, and financial policies. But then I want to talk about um, the long-run challenges in terms of productivity, inequality, and participation, uh, many of those being shared long-run challenges, many being areas where we can all um, learn from each other. In terms of setting the scene, growth um, across the advanced economies, as we all know, um, has consistently disappointed. It's consistently come in below what the IMF has expected. Although in the last two years, it did actually um, pick up and um, is expected to stay about the same over the next year. This has been substantial differences um, across countries, and I actually prefer to look at um, real GDP in per capita terms, and I apologize, in per capita terms, um, Europe, uh, your area still hasn't recovered to where it was prior to the crisis, and it looks like it's going to be basically about a decade, um, a lost decade in terms of economic growth measured in per capita GDP. You see a similar divergence, as we all know, um, in terms of the unemployment rates, where um, the unemployment rate in Europe right now is twice what it is in the United States. Of course, there's a long-standing divergence between the two, but this gap, at least as of last year, was larger than any time since the late 1990s, and the unemployment rate in Europe is higher than any time, has been higher than any time since um, the late 1990s as well. Um, what do I think, um, you know, in the United States, we didn't get everything right. Um, there were certainly things that um, we proposed that Congress didn't pass. There are maybe things we should have figured out or done differently. But I think broadly speaking, we did have a response that was rapid, vigorous, and sustained. In terms of fiscal policy, the first fiscal expansion not shown on this chart was passed in February 2008, two months after the business cycle peak, but six months before anyone even realized the United States was in recession. You then um, combine the Recovery Act of 2009, 12 subsequent fiscal measures, and you get an average of 2% of GDP in discretionary fiscal expansion, and then on top of that, the automatic stabilizers. At the same time, um, monetary policy cut rates to zero and kept them there for seven straight years. 
combined with a balance sheet expansion to $4.4 trillion by the end of 2015, um, a recapitalization of the, ba of the banking system, and a stress test to assess the degree to which that recapitalization was successful. In contrast, um, Europe has had more, um, at least of an aspiration to austerity, that at some points has been um, achieved, at some points less so, but in any case, um, less of this type of consistent fiscal response. We all know monetary policy um, raised rates in 2011, cut them back again, and didn't do a substantial balance sheet expansion until 2015, and the financial response has been hampered by having a national level response in many respects to a currency area wide problem together with stress tests that at least in the initial versions um, were not considered credible. Um, in terms of where to go from here, um, think that fiscal policy, either greater fis flexibility in meeting targets and goals or fiscal expansion in those places that have space would be helpful um, you know, in the United States. Um, we've done some of that at the end of last year, buying back 90% um, of the sequester, the automatic across the board cut. That puts us in a mildly fiscally expansionary position. Um, and it's even more needed um, in Europe. Economically, I think there's considerably more fiscal space than many would think. Interest rates, um, it's not just that interest rates, real interest rates, are low today. Real interest rates were low in 2005 and six before we went into the crisis. So this is indicative that it's not some unnaturally temporary thing done by monetary policy. It's reflective of a longer-term structural change in the economy. That's created um, more fiscal space. There's more fiscal space because it's zero interest rates. Um, fiscal policy can be more expansionary and potentially even reduce the debt as a share of GDP. Um, and there's more because you can always undertake medium-term um, fiscal contractions. Demand, of course, um, is not the only problem that um, the global economy faces. There has been um, uniformly disappointing growth of productivity as well. And if you look at the advanced economies, productivity growth had been 2% um, two you know, and then in the last decade slowed to 1%. And 29 out of the 31 um, advanced economies have seen slowdowns in their productivity growth. There's been a lot of debate and discussion about what's caused this. I think you know, no one knows for sure. No one should be overly confident that they understand what's happened or they understand what's going to happen. But because I was only given 15 minutes, I'll skip all the other caveats, nuances, and explanations um, and put one down on the table that I think is particularly relevant. And that's that there has been a shortfall in investment. If you compare the IMF spring 2007 forecast to investment, in um, 2014, investment is pretty much about 20% below what you would have expected everywhere. Most of that shortfall is in the form of business investment. You could debate the causes, um, but since I have the microphone, I'll just assert um, that it's due to inadequate demand and, and cite the IMF and the OECD's analysis on the accelerator model for that. Slowing um, investment growth has played a role in the productivity slowdown in just about all of the advanced economies. This shows the G7 and everywhere but Canada. Um, capital deepening has slowed from 2004 to 2014 relative to the previous decade. That's the orange bar there. In the United States, in fact, um, this is the second derivative that's negative. In the United States, the first derivative is negative too, in that we have right now capital shallowing, less capital per worker in 2015 than we had in the year 2010, something that's unprecedented in the post-war period. In Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States, that slowdown in capital investment has been a larger factor than the slowdown in TFP. But everywhere, the slowdown in TFP has played a role. 
policy can matter here. And there's a whole lot of them um, that potentially matter, but just to put a few down on the table, um, some of the same demand policies I was talking about um, matter here as well insofar as you're investing in infrastructure and research. Promoting innovation via trade, um, which we're trying to do in the United States by passing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we think there's a great opportunity this year to work with an administration that's very supportive of TTIP to conclude um, the negotiations on TTIP. In the United States, we have the highest um, statutory tax rate of any of uh, the advanced economies, and so we need to lower our rate and also get rid of loopholes, promoting um, immigration generally, including high-skilled immigration. And then in the context of Europe, um, the digital sim single market has um, the potential to um, address the disparate treatment of digital firms across borders, create something more like the U.S. economy. It's important it does it um, in that way, in an open and competitive manner, not um, as creating a barrier or disparate treatment across um, Europe versus other borders. Productivity growth is one of the three structural challenges I wanted to put down on the table. The second one is inequality. Um, as is well known um, in this particular regard, the United States has the highest inequality and has seen the fastest increases in that inequality. The dominant explanation of that in economics has been grounded in competitive markets. Wages are set by supply equaling demand. And the demand curve for high-skilled workers shifted out because of skill bias technological change. The supply curve of skilled workers shifted in because there was a slowdown in the increase of educational attainment, and the result was an increase in relative wages for high-skilled relative to low-skilled. That competitive explanation is, I think, an important part of the story, but I think there's evidence that it's not the only part of the story, and we've done a lot of work on this at the Council of Economic Advisors that you can find more in the prepared remarks here or in the first chapter of our recent economic report of the president. What we've talked about is the role that non-competitive explanations have. One is just the way institutional structures change the way rents are divided. And the second is the growth of rents um, themselves. In terms of the division, um, we've seen in the United States a decline in unionization from 28% union coverage in 1970 to 10% today. At the same time, the minimum wage fell in real terms by 17%. You haven't seen changes um, quite as stark as that in most European countries, and that's one of the reasons, I think, why inequality has um, gone up more in the United States than Europe. It's not just the increase in, uh, the, not just the division of rents that matter, but there's also evidence um, for the increase in rents. If you look at industrial concentration, um, it's risen in 12 of the 13 industries in the U.S. economy. This could help explain why the safe rate of return has consistently gone down since the 1980s while the rate of return to private capital has stayed the same or um, even risen. And we've also seen a large disparate increase in um, the skewness of rates of return. Successful businesses, the 90th percentile, used to have rates of return about three times higher than median businesses. Now it is 10 times higher. There's um, you know, a lot of reasons we could talk about um, why all of this has happened, but one of them seems to be that there's less um, fluidity and dynamism in the economy. Um, the United States is still an enormously fluid and dynamic economy um, compared to many, but you've seen a rise in the share of workers that require an occupational license, and you've seen a decline in um, firm um, entry rates that means that existing firms are older and um, larger. This perspective tells us that in addressing inequality, some of the policy remedies are the traditional ones, like investing in education, 
and income support for low-income households, but that you also need to reduce the concentration of market power and rent-seeking behavior. And there's a potential that under that heading, some interventions might even be positive for efficiency and equity. Um, raising the minimum wage, supporting collective bargaining. Um, it's not just antitrust that matters in policy in um, product markets, but understanding things like patent rules can create patent thickets around technology products, lead to excessive um, litigation rather than innovation, and can reduce competition as well. When wireless spectrum is hoarded by a very small number of companies, that reduces um, competition, and we have an initiative underway to look for a number of, sort of non-traditional ways to expand competition. Reforming occupational licensing and land use restrictions um, would also help with inequality. The last topic I wanted to put down on the table is participation. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, labor force participation. And here there's a sort of traditional view that the United States has made a choice. We're not going to combat inequality as much. We're not going to have as many unions. We're not going to have as high a minimum wage. We're not going to do as well on inequality. But at least we'll get the benefit of the flip side, which is well-functioning labor markets where everyone um, can participate and get a job. Unfortunately, that bargain hasn't worked out in exactly that manner. And it's not just that we've gotten high inequality, but we've also had serious challenges with participation. So I'm focusing my discussion on prime age workers. That's between 25 and 54, which I think covers most of this room. And apologies to anyone left out. Um, you know, we've done well at youth employment, done well at older employment, um, done less well here, and I think it's important um, to try to understand why. For men, the share not participating has risen from 3% to 12% steadily for 60 straight years. For women, it was, uh, women were entering the workforce, but it has since stabilized. If you look at the United States compared to other countries, this comparison shows the employment population ratio. We are towards the bottom um, for both men and women, and a number of countries that are below us are countries that are in worse cyclical positions. We've also fallen more in terms of labor force participation. I think this is notable because if you look at the OECD measures where the most flexible labor markets, the least employment protections, um, the low, among the lowest minimum wages, where we do badly is paid leave, expenditures on active labor market policies, support for child care, um, tax wedge on secondary earners, and the like. And I think what this tells me is that to understand how labor markets function, it can't just be a simple recipe of make your labor markets as flexible as possible. You also need to have them be supportive and have um, connective tissue as well. And there's a whole lot of things um, you know, that we're trying to do focused on that that comes basically out of what I was just um, discussing. Conclude by saying, you know, I think at the moment we're in in the global economy, we're not at the same type of peril we were in um, nine years ago. We are seeing faster growth rates. The biggest uh, worry I have is complacency, that we'd come to accept the situation we have and not continue to do better, uh, try to do better, both in the short run in terms of demand and in the long run in terms of addressing these structural issues, um, productivity, inequality, and participation. Great. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, over, to, over to you, um, and I'll do the, try to find the, the slide for you. Please Thank you. Well, thanks to, to Bruegel for the invitation to, to, to discuss this, uh, this very impressive view. I have to say I feel some affinity as well with uh, Jason because I will also be joining modestly the, the, the French uh, Council of Economic Advice or the equivalent of it, of which uh, Guntram is also a member. Uh, so I'm more, I look at those policy issues more closely and I will try to <coughs> Having not seen your presentation before, I will try to be complementary <laughs> and, uh, and add some, some, uh, some uh, perspective, more European perspective to, to what you've said. 
Uh, but if I were to, to summarize the challenges in the EU in the short term, we do have a recovery which, which is very moderate. Uh, an issue we still have, and I'll come back to that on the structural uh, dimension, is that we have a large heterogeneity across EU countries. Uh, we still have a big question mark about the financial sector, in particular the banking sector restructuring. And we that's something we might discuss, but we, we, we have, to some extent, a limited room for fiscal stimulus on aggregate. Some member states have more room than others, but uh, it does uh, objectively limit our ability to, to, to use the advantages of the current environment, in particular of low interest rates, uh, to do more on that front. Uh, we also have concerns in Europe uh, about the effectiveness of monetary policy, might be due to factors well known to everyone, the timing of what has been implemented relative to the timing of the crisis. Uh, we also have something which I won't you know, comment on either, but we have political risks that some of them have materialized. You have to look at what happened in Austria uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, some of them might be ahead of us with big uh, deadlines uh, such as the uh, British or UK referendum in June, uh, but not only, there's a couple of, of general elections that might uh, provide surprises. All of this happening with migrations in the background that might uh, accelerate some extreme scenarios, but I won't come back to that. In the longer term, and here I would share, very much share your view, your analysis of the US economy and see a lot of parallel, parallels with, with what we have in the EU. Uh, we have a competitiveness issue with the productivity slowdown. We do have a, democratic, a demographic issue, which is not, uh, that's a kind of a contrast with the US, or at least in some areas of the EU we do have this issue, in others we don't. Uh, and we also have a huge institutionalist issue, which is completing the uh, euro area and completing the EU. And we are now probably at a sta step where it is a make or break uh, point. It has to do with the single market, but it also has to do with the positive and successful initiatives we've had, had since the crisis, starting with the banking union and, and also going on with the cap capital markets union. Uh, so that's it. Now, a few macro facts, uh, you've, you've mentioned the macro dynamics since the crisis here. I just wanted to put in perspective the US, the European Union, and the emerging world to say we have had this huge difference after 2011, where Europe has been really lagging relative to the US, but we are still both part of the advanced world. So we still have this world where you have emerging uh, uh, economies that have steep, I mean, fairly uh, slowed down, but we are in a, in a sort of common pool of low growth or lower steady state rates of growth that are uh, on a sort of comparable scale relative to the uh, emerging economies. Now, in, uh, I, want, I turn now to this productivity TFP issue that you, you, you mentioned as one of the main issues uh, for the longer term uh, challenges. And I wanted to compare... But you also have caveats. I, yes. <laughs> I put them here because the next slide becomes even worse. <clears throat> here we use a potential output model, which is very close to the, to the IMF one. So all the caveats that apply to the IMF one do apply here. And we have an estimate of potential output, which allows us also to do a growth decomposition ex exercise of potential, uh, very rough, but basically, so on the left-hand side, it's potential outputs in the US and in the EU, huge difference, as you uh, commented already earlier. But then on the right-hand side, you have uh, periods, averages of the contribution to this potential output growth uh, in terms of capital, labor, and, and TFP. So one big fact, first set of uh, uh, bars is the EU, the second is the US. Uh, first key fact is that TFP contribution to potential growth has basically disappeared in, 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 in Europe. It has halved uh, in the US, but it's still a, a driver. Now, if I um, go deeper, so this is the same chart basically, looking at a more, you know, more time series dimension on the right hand side, and we indeed see uh, that in the US uh, it has been mostly a capital stock investment issue. And that's basically what you were saying in terms of capital shallowing and the re reduction of the capital to labor ratio, which you obviously see here. You also see here that the labor market helps. 
even though you have a declining, you know, you, you're not so good in, in terms of improving labor participation, the labor component of potential is still helping, which is when you then turn to uh, Europe, not the case in Europe. I won't comment the, the chart on the euro area. I will just comment the, the, the charts on single countries because I've, I've taken Germany, France, and Italy uh, to, to show you that uh, on the right-hand side again, uh, behind potential growth, we have very different stories. Here, this is uh, the decomposition for France. And we see that TFP has really driven growth until the crisis, big time. And after the crisis, uh, TFP growth has disappeared. The labor supply uh, has, in relative terms, again, uh, has contributed rather po positively. We have demographics that help, and we have a number of factors in the, you know, in, in the labor market that, uh, that, that help as well. Uh, but that's the French story. If you turn to Germany, uh, it's, 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 it's not the same. Uh, the, you know, the labor component, and we, you can trace that back to reforms that have been applied through time, but the labor component has not been so systematically supportive, but TFP has sort of remained more resilient. And the third <laughs> point of comparison, I didn't comment the levels because the levels are really appalling when you compare to the US, the level of pot potential growth. But then when, when you look at Italy, the picture in Italy, you see that here, uh, there is a compounding effect of, of, of issues related to underinvestment and, and, and behind the capital stock uh, related to the labor market and to TFP that has had a consistently negative impact on the growth of potential output ever since the early, uh, the early 2000s. So we have this heterogeneity and it's very difficult to find a common sort of uh, a policy that would fit all, uh, all <coughs> profiles. Now, uh, you didn't really mention monetary policy. I'm closing now on, on, on the next two topic. I think we do share a, a, a common uh, challenge for the medium term, medium to long term, and it's the, the unwinding of monetary policy uh, as it has been uh, you know, applied by the Fed and by the ECB. The Fed has doing, done it in the right, at the right time, so it has had an impact, a macroeconomic impact, uh, uh, which was uh, sizable uh, in, market, in terms of market effect and in terms of macro effect. Uh, it's not clear that it is the case for the ECB, and in any case, at some point, we will have to face the issue of how do you unwind those positions and what do you do with monetary policy. Now, I'm not an orthodox, so I would say what we need is to be able to price risk right on the market. So at some point, we will have to let you know, interest rate reflect credit risk, reflect term, term risk, so that investment can be made in a meaningful way from an economic point of view. Uh, but we also have to make up our, ma our mind about what, how we reconcile monetary policy with the excess leveraging that we have in the economy, both on the public and private sector uh, side. So, here we will have to uh, answer the question, do we want to use that public debt that is on the balance sheet of, of central banks to you know, use the, central banks of, uh, uh, the, the balance sheets of central banks to wipe out some of these debts? This is a question I think we will have to, we will have to uh, ask ourselves. And there I would say without irony that the exorbitant privilege of the dollar might help on one side of the Atlantic and will not help on, on, on our side. But this is open for discussion. Uh, I think I will stop here. There's a bit uh, same remark about fiscal uh, balances, but we can uh, um, you know, uh, tackle this uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, I have some facts on investment, but again, it can be interesting in, in, when we come to the, to the underlying dynamics of investment in the US and in Europe. In Europe, simply what I want to flag here, don't look at the numbers, you'll have them in the slides, but uh, uh, it's basically, this is an exercise that looks at the uh, composition of the investment gap in Europe and basically sees whether we need more investment in R&D or we need investments in motorways. And the bottom line of this exercise is that we need both. Uh, we do need some, some you know, investment in basic wa water in infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, but also, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's about half-half what, what we need. So we shouldn't be too, uh, too dogmatic about R&D, 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 and forget about the quality of the infrastructures that are very complementary, in a sense, to, 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 to cutting-edge investment. Uh, I think I will stop here. My closing message was 
about the vulnerabilities in the financial sector that are very euro specific europe specific i think starting with the with the non performing loans on the the asset side of, of of the balance sheets of banks but also extending to the liability side but we can discuss that uh, further uh, later if there's interest thank you great uh, thank you very much uh, this was uh, was great um, so i think we have now two very complementary uh, presentations so I think we will uh, first take a couple of questions, Jason, from the audience, and then you can also in the reply also react to some mm -hmm. of what, what Natasha, Natasha has said. Um, but per, per, perhaps let me add one question um, uh, to what also Natasha has been saying, which is about this capital labor uh, ratio and, the, you know, the shallow capital investment. You mentioned that, I think, a, a few times. You know, what I don't, don't get squared in my head is that um, we are seeing a fall in the labor income share, national labor income share in the U.S., which is quite substantial. So income that is generated that is going to labor is actually falling. Now, how do you square that with a shallow capital labor ratio? I mean, this, this, this is, is, it seems to be a paradox, but perhaps there's an easy explanation, uh, explanation to this, but I think it's actually okay. quite a fundamental right. issue. I think there's two possibilities. Uh, I mean, there's probably lots of possibilities, but I'll name two. One is in the last three years, the labor share has actually stabilized and risen a little bit. Right. Um, so we're not seeing exactly that fact. But I think if you look over a five or ten year horizon, your point is exactly right. Um, the rents perspective I gave, I think, gives you one possible answer, which is if you have more concentration, more monopoly power, more ability to exert that power... Um, you won't necessarily invest very much. You won't necessarily boost quantities, um, but you will do really well in terms of your profits. And so that is, I think, another piece of evidence that that's an important aspect of what's going on um, in the economy. All right. Thank you. So let me let me collect a, a few questions, um, comments, uh, please. And please also always identify yourself quickly. Oh, sure. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, the gentleman there in the back, yes. Third. No questions? I cannot believe that. <laughs> uh, uh, Gregory, uh, yes. take those three, I think, and then, and then we go for a second round. Please, Jason. Sure. Um, uh, just to take those in order, um, the debt impacting the economy, private indebtedness has gone down substantially in the last many years. Um, there's been both less credit extended in areas like housing um, and you know, incomes have risen. If you look at debt service, that's historically low. Um, for households, for example, um, interest payments as a share of disposable personal income is the lowest that's been recorded. So part of what we've seen is a swap of private debt went down, balance sheet recession, 
public debt had to step in and fill the gap, and it did so pretty effectively, which is why the economy recovered, and you know why you saw, you know some of the differences uh, I mentioned with Europe. In terms of the public indebtedness situation, the deficit has fallen from 10% of GDP to 2.5% of GDP last year. The debt has obviously risen, but debt service payments as a share of GDP are quite low, and about as low as they've been for a couple decades. Of course, interest rates likely aren't going to stay where they are now, and certainly when we do our forecasts, we assume interest rates are going to rise. The single largest error we've made in our economic forecasts every year for the last seven years is overestimating the imminence and magnitude of that rise in interest rates. And the rise in interest rates we have built into our forecast now exceeds what the markets are expecting. And there's a number of reasons in terms of liquidity in the tips market, et cetera, to discount those market expectations. So, um, you know, I don't think you see, you don't want to assume interest rates are going to be 2%, but I don't think, um, I don't think we're unprepared. On a looking forward basis, the fiscal gap, how much you'd need to cut tax, raise taxes or cut spending today to stabilize the debt as share of GDP is smaller today than what it was five or six years ago. And that's partly because of fiscal steps we've taken, higher um, taxes on high-income households and cutting spending, um, and also because health care is growing a lot more slowly than it used to, partly because of the Affordable Care Act, partly for other reasons. So I, you know, I'm worried about debt in lots of places in the world. Um, I'm much less worried about it, frankly, in the United States. And I think the danger in a lot of other countries might even be to worry too much about it to the point where you don't take the steps you need to for growth rather than worrying too little. Um, in terms of the policy matters, and the you, you framed it in terms of inflation and consumption, but basically the whole <laughs> argument I made on the differences in the levels of GDP and the rate of unemployment in terms of you know, the consistency and of monetary policy, fiscal policy, and financial policy um, explain uh, you know, differences in inflation and consumption. And, and when we're a lot closer to our long-run unemployment rate than the euro area is, it shouldn't be surprising that you see differences um, in areas like inflation. Um, in terms of the banking sector reform, I think it's been um, very successful in terms of creating a system that is much safer. You know, you, you people have all sorts of lists of the different things they're worried about in the global economy right now, a hard landing in China, Brexit, immigration, you know, um, Natasha had a lot of these things. Um, Natasha did not have on her list the U.S. financial system or the U.S. banking system, and nor do I think it... Uh, Let's not talk about that. Um, uh, nor do I think it should have been on her list, um, and nor is it on anyone's list, and it's not on anyone's list because bank capital is much higher um, than, than what it was. The practices are safer. The supervision is better. There's more of a provision for unwinding institutions if they get um, into problems. I think there's more we could do, especially in terms of shadow banking. Um, the housing finance system is something that we have wanted to reform and haven't, so the two uh, major housing finance agencies are in government conservatorship, um, and that's not a sustainable long-run solution. So I think there are things we need to finish, but frankly, the most important debate within our financial reform process is do we keep all the good things we've done, or do we erode or undermine them? And so just keeping what we have would be sort of 90% of the good one would want to achieve in that regard. Okay, um, I have Gregory, then you, um, and please, Gregory, you start. Yeah, so Gregory from Bruegel. Uh, I have a question for, for Jason. In fact, um, I noted in one of your slides when you were discussing um, the policy option to reduce inequality and to have a more inclusive growth in the U.S., uh, you noted uh, to raise the minimum wage and to support collect collective bargaining. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny, in fact, to hear that here because I think it's something that you don't hear often in Brussels. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, what are your views on this? Do you think that it's because uh, between Europe and the US we are on, on, let's say, on different side of the optimal level of minimum wage and uh, collective bargaining? Or, is it, or do you think that um, 
So it's because, uh, once again, it's a mistaken uh, European uh, policy. I'm not sure. Uh, I think the first is definitely true. You know, the minimum wage in the United States is $7.25, um, the national minimum wage. That's below, on an inflation-adjusted, exchange rate-adjusted basis, just about every country that anyone's from in this room. And we have higher productivity and higher per capita income, so ours should be actually be higher, um, potentially. So, you know, in that sense, I could be right that we need to raise our minimum wage and, and people, you know, elsewhere could be right in the other direction. Um, collective bargaining, um, you know, possibly, you know, possibly a similar type of story there. So I think the two sides of a curve is one interpretation that could be correct. It gives me some pause, though, the discussion I had about labor force participation. If you know, the theory was completely right, then the United States should have higher inequality but higher labor force participation. And instead, we have higher inequality and lower labor force participation or lower employment population ratios. You, know, you compare France and the United <coughs> States, and, and our EPOP for prime age workers is lower. And so that gives me some pause and makes me think the right answer um, at the very minimum isn't perfect flexibility in labor markets. You certainly need government policy above and beyond that. And, you know, is there scope for a decent amount without a trade-off? Um, possibly. So the gentleman here. Hi, Jason. Um, okay, Paul. You met last month yeah. in, uh, in Stanford, so nice to see you again. Listen, I, the figures you presented on the U.S. labor market were... Um, were shocking, frankly, and I've not uh, seen that particular data presented in that particular way uh, before. I'm just wondering, particularly since there's an election in the United States, would you have any advice for an incoming president on what they might be able to do? You've sketched out a little bit of a theory sideways in some of your comments here, um, but that's a serious matter, and I just point out in passing, we were here to talk about divergences today. It sounds to me like the U.S. labor market is becoming more like the European one, uh, if this trend is, uh, is correct. I'm curious about the solution. Let, let's collect, but but let me let me add uh, to to this comment. Uh, of course, what I, what I found also striking in this participation rate is this difference between women and men, and so this um, uh, this um, this story about sort of the angry white middle class man um, that now turns his back uh, to uh, to mainstream politics and votes for people who are against openness and trade. I mean, it seems to seems to have some, at least some, some roots in the numbers, and I was wondering if you, if you wanted to comment on that a bit further. But there's a gentleman there in the back. Szolek Bozek, European Commission. First, uh, referring to the labor force participation, I'd like to point to the differences in EU and US developments in that respect. The, the EU-US comparison of unemployment rates would look quite different if you had taken this into account. I mean, labor force participation does go up in the EU and, and uh, in Europe, so it becomes a drag on the unemployment rate advances versus it is going down <coughs> still, regardless of some uh, pickup lately in the US. Um, secondly, uh, I have a few questions. I mean, you, you, you presented this comparison of the, of the crisis response mostly. I mean, notwithstanding the, the, the large differences there, I'd like you to comment on a few other Possibly relevant factors, institutional factors, I mean, that have been put forward, further like uh, the differences in the legal system that, that help the U.S. Uh, households the leverage faster in non-recourse uh, loans and, and, and otherwise. Uh, secondly, the banking system, the reliance on, on the EU of the, on, the, on the banking system uh, that proved so uh, uh, disadvantages in the times of the crisis versus direct financing in the in the U.S. Secondly, energy, prices of energy. I mean, the U.S. has enjoyed, up until recently, a very significant uh, benefit from, from lower uh, energy prices. That has nothing to do, I mean, all, all of these have little or nothing to do with the crisis response. And, I mean, it's basically uh, uh, put Europe in a much dis more disadvantaged position there. And I, I take the third one, uh, Maria. Maria de Mertes from the European Commission. Um, I was wondering if I could go back to the issue of the private debt. Um, <clears throat> what is it that we're not doing in Europe that the US did to reduce the MPLs, but also to reduce the debt overhang on the demand side? Okay. I think these are three very easy ones. So, uh... <laughs> so I think... Um, 
Yeah, I think if you want to understand some of what's going on in American society today, you know, looking at that, 3% of prime age men weren't working in the 1950s, and now it's 12%. And this isn't because they're married to working women. About 20% of them are married to working women. And back then, it was even more married to working women. There weren't as many working women then, but they you know, somehow found all of them. Um, so it's not that. Um, it's not disability insurance or you know, public programs have grown. Um, disability insurance has grown by two percentage points. That's grown by nine percentage points. And some of the rise in disability is probably a function of whatever caused that to rise rather than the cause of it. Um, it's not like our social welfare system is you know, so wonderful that um, you're just going to want to take off the rest of your life and subsist on it um, in the United States. So I think it is um, a challenge to some of our notions. And, and when you look at the rising inequality in terms of lifespans and the absolute declines in um, life expectancy for households towards the bottom of the income distribution, and in particular, you know, the white male um, decline life expectancy. I think this is all, you know, part wrapped up in something. I don't think we have a fully satisfying explanation. We know the group that that is is generally people with high school education or less. You know, you look at the rise of opioids, you look at the uh, increase in incarceration and the lagged effects of that on people after they exit. Um, so I don't think we fully understand it. I don't think we need to fully understand it to figure out what we need to do to address it. And I had a lot of things on that slide um, in the prepared remarks, but you know, more job search assistance and unemployment insurance, a wage insurance system that gives you encouragement to move into a new job. Um, less occupational licensing, criminal justice reform would help on, on one aspect of it. So I think, I think there's a bunch of different things um, that we need to do in that regard. Um, you know, in terms of the US-EU comparison, um, I think unemployment rates probably is, broadly speaking, the right way to do it, because I think our decline in LFPR has largely been structural, and so if you want a clearer reading of demand, I would compare the unemployment rates. If you want to ask all in structurally, then you want to take into account that structural unemployment rates are higher here, and we've had a longstanding decline in LFPR. But what we've seen there, labor force participation, is basically what we saw before the crisis. So I think that's analytically for the question of demand, the right way to think about it. Um, of course, there's a lot of differences in the experience that we've had. The legal system, I think it's probably helped, although there actually was less you know, people walking away from houses and not repaying their mortgages than we expected. So we thought in 2009 that that was going to be a bigger factor than it ultimately was. Certainly having um, capital markets and a more diversified financial system um, is helpful. And, you know, and, and diversified matters too. You, know, you see... Um, the high yield market not functioning um, quite as well right now, and banking is continuing to lend money at the same pace. So there's a little bit as one gets weaker, you can move to the other. And prices of energy, on the one hand, help the United States on, uh, but it's a more complicated story than that. For example, the oil price decline has the United States is more hedged because we have more oil production. So in the last two years, that has been an unambiguous plus for the euro area um, and for Europe as a whole. And for the United States, um, it's been you know, more mixed. In terms of you know, private debt, um, I don't fully know the answer to that. I mean, the... Or, or even partially, um, you know, our deleveraging was less about restructuring debt at the household level. There was a little bit of that. It was far more about reducing credits to households, and you know that's been mixed. I mean, I think that housing credit has been too tight in um, the United States for some time now, and there's been an overreaction too. But that overreaction has helped lead to this 
deleveraging. I mean, in terms of things like um, NPLs, it's it's easier for you know our banks than say Italian banks to you know sell things on to others, get it off their balance sheets, and Italy's obviously trying um, to set up a system to do that, and you know just. You know, for us, recapitalizing the banking system was a central part of our approach to the crisis with TARP that was passed in 2008 and implemented in 2008 and 9. And here, there are, you know, there isn't a Europe wide mechanism for doing that, and there's a ban on, on you know, state level doing that for state aid reasons. So, in some ways, the whole set of institutions push you away from the type of solution that, that we did. Okay, we can take one or two more questions, but let me just remark on the on the um, state aid to banks. I mean, I think the story in, in the eurozone has been very much one that we had these two waves of, of banking crisis. The first one, which was much more the core banks um, in the in the core countries, Germany, <coughs> France, um, and so on, that had actually a lot of exposure to the U.S. subprime market. And if you look at the numbers, there was actually quite a bit of recapitalization of, uh, of the banking system in the, in the core. And then we had the second wave, more around 2011-12, uh, which was m much more related to the sort of general eurozone crisis and Euro, Euro, uh, uh, European sovereign debt, debt crisis also. Um, and uh, arguably, um, that affected much more the, uh, the, the periphery countries. And there, the, the recapitalization now indeed um, <coughs> enters into, into uh, the situation that we have changed the state aid rules, and we have now this so-called BRRD, <coughs> uh, another acronym, Bank Recovery and Regu uh, Resolution Directive, which is at least seen in some quarters as being too restrictive, even though um, I think it, it has the right intention, namely the right intention of, of removing... Um, uh, you know, a policy of uh, generalized bailout of everybody uh, to, uh, to a policy where um, failures are borne by those who, who made the wrong investment decisions also. So, so, so I think it's, it's, it's a more, more nuanced story with the core um, having, yeah. having had quite, quite a bit of recapitalization, actually, in response to the U.S., um, your story, uh, in, in 2008. That's fair. But let me let me collect one more or two more, and then I just had a question about that the core versus peripheral banking crises. Right. Actually, so uh, I have heard thoughts that the core was fortunate in that they were able to address their banking crisis before more stringent fiscal rules kicked in, and that Italy, for instance, had an election uh, close to the time that, that was happening, and they just missed the window when they could have within the old set of fiscal rules uh, recapitalized or taken care of their banking problem. I don't know how much uh, credibility that has in Bruegel, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no Bruegel view anyway. There's different views of different scholars. Um, but I, I think it's a good question. But I think it's not the fiscal rules. I think you probably mean the, the banking rules that, that are more constraining now. Or are you meaning the fiscal rules? No, the fiscal rules in that it takes some taxpayer money to... No, but I think usually the commission sometimes. is quite uh, quite relaxed about um, uh, breaching the fiscal rules if it is for um, such reasons, <laughs> <laughs> so, I suppose. <laughs> but I mean, there's many commission officials that may want to comment on that point <laughs> point here. So I don't think the fiscal rules are the main constraint. I think it's more, if if at all, it's more the banking uh, banking constraints and the state aid rules. Okay, please one more here. Yeah, then, Expansion is key, something that you had in the US we didn't have in uh, the EU. And for the long run, we have to take care of uh, rising inequalities. Now, that said, and once the uh, economic analysis is there, the diagnosis is shared. As an economist that is fully aware of the 
let's uh, let's take one one or two more, um, please. Uh, Jean-Luc Fipney, Council Secretariat. Um, you, you you did mention um, uh, start um, growing concentration in most of the industries and rent-seeking behavior, etc. I was wondering, what is in your view um, the prospective contribution of the financial sector to growth over the long term in the U.S. and possibly abroad in relation to that uh, concentration issue? All right, I, th I think we, we concluded here with you uh, giving, uh, answering those two questions, and, and then I think our hour is, is up, so, so please. Yeah, great. So, um, you know, President Obama often asks me for my advice on economic matters. Occasionally, I try to inject into that advice some thought about how to get Congress to pass something or to get them to not pass something. And if I'm lucky, he only rolls his eyes when I give him that advice about how to deal with Congress. Um, so I don't think um, my ability to advise you on the questions you asked is, is any better than my ability to advise him on, on how to deal with our political situation. Um, so I, I'll just say good luck. <laughs> um, and uh, your question, oh, Oh, concentration, concentration, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think there's a decent amount of evidence that the, um, I think the issue in the financial system, in the United States at least, is less about concentration and the size of the largest institutions. Our largest banks, as a share of our economy, are small compared to the banks in most European countries as a share of their economy. You know, our banks are healthy in terms of capital, as I said before. Uh, you know, even if they weren't, you're not going to bankrupt the United States because you know one of our banks um, goes bankrupt in the way that you know Iceland is obviously an extreme example, but you know Europe is on right. the continuum somewhere between. Uh, in the rest of Europe is on the continuum somewhere between. Iceland and the United States. That's a good way to do it. Uh, those two. Um, I, I think what is of greater long-run concern is the size of the financial sector um, as a share of GDP and the amount of talent it attracts. I think it does a very important set of jobs in terms of allocating capital, um, transforming um, maturities, hedging risks. But it's hard to argue that the expenditures that go into you know, building faster ways to get data from here to there for high-speed trading is a socially productive um, activity. It's hard to argue that you know, getting information a second before, you know, or a millisecond or nanosecond before someone else um, really matters. So I think um, you know, there's things we can do. For example, you, know, you get a tax benefit for working at a hedge fund that you don't get for working anywhere else in the economy um, called carried interest. Probably there aren't positive externalities associated with hedge funds such that they're in need of additional subsidies so that we can have a larger amount of them than we would otherwise have in a, a free market economy. Um, so we could take away some of those things and, and we've proposed things like fees on you know large banks associated with their risk and scale. So I, I think the tax system and elsewhere, taking a harder look at that over-financialization of the economy question um, is important. And here it probably is both concentration um, and share of the economy. Great. Thank you very much for this very interesting and uh, I think very broad, uh, but at the same time deep discussion. So please uh, all join me in, in thanking, uh, thanking Jason for this wonderful presentation of the good discussion. <laughs>